Hello, and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where Hollywood has lowered the bar and ticket prices so they can have more victories. They're literally moving, well, I don't know if they're moving the finish line, come to think of it, because, you know, we're still looking at a regular top ten. But, you know, it's speaking of Tom Brady, it's a little bit like, you know, playing around with the footballs. So let's discuss. So the big story of the weekend is actually 80 for Brady, where Paramount talked theater owners into offering matinee prices for all showings. And that senior special mobilized a small army of older white women. What the heck, Rita Moreno? Why wasn't she able to do a better job mobilizing the Latino audience? You know who is who has emerged as a huge Latino star? Pedro Pascal. His ability to mobilize South America for viewership for The Last of Us is one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. And that brings, I think, tremendous value to him as a selling point. You know, we'll see what happens going forward, but that that was just an incredible thing to see. Uh, Perhaps a little bit more diversity in the cast would have plussed this pick even more, although maybe this is just the demo that likes Tom Brady. But overall, you can't deny that this, with this and a man called Otto, An older, whiter, and more conservative movie-going base in the middle of the country is emerging. I mean, 78% white? Just wow! I think that's, that is, that is now, that beat out a man called Otto, Otto for the whitest audience we've seen yet. And it's number two! It's number two! I mean, it's not a strong number two, but still! Um, you would think that would be a smaller audience. Uh, but you know, again, we're dealing with smaller numbers overall in the top ten. As I've been saying, we're looking at a fracturing of the audience where people just go and see stories that are made to appeal directly to them rather than broadening their horizons by checking out stories that, you know, not only introduce us to new things, but bring us all together. Ah, I don't want to lose that. All right, so anyway, Paramount, though, is very happy because 80 for Brady came in just a smidge under 2018's Book Club. It has the same A- cinema score, and 80 for Brady actually has a much stronger RT audience score. Jane Fonda is in both movies, returning here, this time with her Grace and Frankie co-star Lily Tomlin, and Grace and Frankie ran for seven seasons on Netflix. Sure, Fonda posted bigger numbers, much bigger numbers, when she had a current big star playing opposite her, but at least Fonda's movies are still getting theatrical releases. Oh, (laughs) I had to do it. I had to do it. Know who else this is great for? Tom Brady. This isn't just based on a true story of some uh, fans who wanted to see Brady play, but he's a producer on this film. Look at him there on the red carpet. Uh, He did this through his production company, 199 Productions. Uh, While many feel that Brady will become a sports commentator like almost every other uh, pro athlete before him who retired, uh, could Brady pull a LeBron and go Hollywood? Why not both? Me thinks Brady's interests uh, are in splashy mega deals. He really loves those. It's the same thing that kept his first retirement from sticking. He was like, how much do you want to pay me? How you doing? And I think that will lead to him accepting whatever offers come his way, which should be plentiful. Brady is open for business. <laughs> I mean, this is pretty cool. This is good for his production company. I'm sure they're going to be on the, they're going to be sending out emails and making calls this week saying, look what we did. Uh, They unseated Avatar, too. On a side note, because we talk about demographics and representation a lot, it's interesting to see that happening in the sports world as well. Tom Brady finally exits the NFL stage, and this year's Super Super Bowl at that moment has two quarterbacks of color, with Mahomes, I love Mahomes, quickly gaining on Brady when it comes to quarterback records, with Mahomes only six years into his career while Brady played for 23. Who knows how high Mahomes could go? I'm excited to see the ratings for next Sunday's game. Uh, And it will also be, by the way, a trailer palooza. All the Hollywood's coming in hot. I'll be covering all of it. Be sure to stay with Beyond the Trailer for reactions and breakdowns of the biggest trailers. I think The Flash and Little Mermaid are going to be hot. Oh, I'm excited. And maybe The Marvels if Disney decides to drop that. Uh, As for M. Night Shyamalan, while he might have taken the number one spot, thank goodness, because for a minute there, it looked like 80 for Brady might overtake him as well. And unseated Avatar, although again, 80 for Brady did that as well. So yeah, this doesn't seem like that much of a victory. M. Night was happy to do a victory lap, tweeting that he was so happy to be in the same top 10 as James Cameron. And he's like, are we? I mean, like, I guess technically we are, but I certainly wouldn't put us in the same ballpark. 
I thought that was nuts. I mean, I don't know. That's kind of M. Night's calling card, a complete lack of total of personal awareness. He's like, I think my movies are great. But, I mean, I guess no one's showing him the C cinema score it got. I mean, this couldn't even match the opening of this last film, Old, and that was already disappointing for him, considering his previous debuts before that. The RT audience score is a little bit kinder, and I think M. Night definitely still has his fan base. Some of you liked this movie. Some of you liked it. I don't know why, but I guess some of you just like that kind of, and it's like, like Pixar. You're like, I love this kind of dark stuff. I love awkward conversations with my family. All right, but anyway, it does seem that his audience has shrunk enough that streaming is maybe a better home for him, with Servant on Apple TV running for four seasons. Also, M. Night makes these films for very little money. This movie and old were so cheap to make, like a lot of horror directors. But where M. Night shines is that he also makes them look very highbrow, and he is still considered a prestige director. People still pay attention. His name still commands attention, to be fair. So he'll likely be able to work for the rest of his life, as long as he wants to, even though I don't think he'll ever get back to his original blockbuster status, largely because of that lack of self-awareness I was talking about. I believe he probably feels he's still doing great, which is weird. Dave Bautista, always be honest with yourself. Dave Bautista has earned rave reviews for Knock at the Cabin and spent a lot of the press tour sharing his hopes and dreams for his own career. And a lot of them were quite moving. He also had that really very, the whole internet rally behind him when he was like, why can't I star in a rom-com? And they were like, Dave Bautista, you can! I saw him with the, what was it, like I Spy or My Spy or something, and he kind of had a romantic angle in that, and I thought it worked. I mean, Dave Bautista, I think the Dave Bautista, I'll say it now, I was going to say it in a minute. Dave Bautista's problem continues to be that he's looking for a Hollywood fairy godmother to come in and go, bink, now you're in the movie you want to be in. Start reading scripts, Bautista. Hire, uh, hire a development executive. Start going through stuff and find what you want to be in and then produce it like Tom Brady did. Tom Brady only has a cameo in 80 for Brady, but maybe Tom Brady's just getting started. Interestingly, though, Bautista said that one of his dreams was to be number one on the call sheet on a Denis Villeneuve film. If you're not familiar with a call sheet, they're divided into above the line and below the line. So if you heard that lingo, there's that as well. Call sheets are good. You should know about call sheets. But number one means you're the star. You're the most important actor on that set. So Dave Bautista says, I, again, I want to be number one on a Denis Villeneuve film. But you know how you get to be number one? by proving you can sell tickets. And Dave Bautista has yet to prove that. And he was the big star on this movie. And he didn't sell a lot of tickets. I mean, I guess he did get a number one. If I were his agent, I'd be like, number one is number one. But if I were a producer on the other end of that call, I'd be like, that's a very pitiful number, man. Uh, although I have to say, if anyone's going to put Dave Bautista at number one, it probably would be Denis Villeneuve, who has worked with a lot of other actors who can't sell tickets either and had the low box office returns to show for it. But maybe they could make a box office bomb together. I wouldn't put it past, you know, but again, Denis Villeneuve isn't going to come up with the idea. Dave Bautista's got to go find that script, call up Denis and say, Denis, and, you know, pull, put on the waterworks and guilt Denis Villeneuve into it. And if the script's good enough... I could see, and if it's small, it's like not too much of a commitment. It's a quick shoot, it's inexpensive, and it shows Dave Bautista in a new light. Dave, Denis Villeneuve might be like, yeah, I'll do it. Or maybe he'll be like, I know somebody else who's a cool up, up and coming director who would do this with you, and I'll produce it and stick my name on it. This is how movies come together. Again, you just can't sit there like waiting for Godot, because you're going to be waiting that long for someone else to come and make all your dreams come true. Just because it happened once. When James Gunn plucked him and Marvel plucked him from the world of wrestling and stuck him in Guardians of the Galaxy, I don't mean it's going to happen again, especially if you want to be in less commercial work. Uh, the diversity demos were strong for Knock at the Cabin, thanks to excellent casting, although they could have apparently done more to appeal to African-American audiences. The movie did skew male, but it's right in that sweet spot of 18 to 34. People who spend money, advertisers and stuff, love them. Hollywood studios love them. I know a lot of you don't care about demographics, and it annoys you every single time I bring it up. But you know what? This is a business, and Hollywood cares very much about demographics, because the name of the game is mobilizing as many people as possible. Movie tickets are at a low price point, so you're doing a volume business. As you might have heard me say before, in the world of fine art, which is just as much a business, don't kid yourself, but you just got to convince one person to pay millions of dollars for your work of art. When it comes to movies, you need to, pay, you need to convince hundreds of thousands. Well, actually, these 
days, tens of thousands of people to buy a ticket to see your movie. And so the, again, the name of the game is to mobilize as many groups as possible, especially for the bigger fair. And you can see Hollywood's not doing a very good job mobilizing across the board right now because these numbers are low. They're low, not avatars though. All right, let's get to the rest of the top 10. Everyone on the face of the earth saw Avatar. Actually, they did not. That's how few people watch movies in theaters. It's always fascinating to me. So if you can break through and get actually a lot of people on the, in the world to go, I guess I should see this movie, even though they hardly ever go, that's how you can like, because you might be wondering, where's all this extra money, money suddenly come from that supercharges these movies that are so far ahead of all the other movies? And that's because very few people, when you think of the 8 billion people on the planet, actually go and see movies in theaters. Oh, it's fascinating. Hollywood, you gotta work harder. That's why streaming is so successful, because streaming is able to go directly to those people, and you know, it's very accessible at a lower price. Talk about price point. Again, that's an even lower price, although that's changing. But you know, you gotta think about accessibility, you gotta think about price point. These are all very interesting things. I love it. All right, so anyway, Avatar might've been bumped down to third place, but that doesn't mean the wind got knocked out of it. It's right behind these films, by the way. It's like, hey, I'm still here. Uh, with only a 32% drop in its eighth weekend. It's broken into the all-time top 10 domestic. He did it! And it's getting very close to Titanic, actually, on the all-time worldwide chart. It needs just about 30 million to take that number three spot. I don't know if it's gonna do it, although never say never at this point with James Cameron. But if it were to overtake that, that would mean that with the exception of Avengers Endgame, the two Avatar movies would be the most successful movies of all time. It would be the only franchise to truly motivate, to mobilize, speaking of mobilization, the entire globe. And I think it's because it's got that corny stuff in it. You know, that stuff sells. It sells. That's amazing. It's amazing! All right, Puss in Boots is also holding up very well with solid worldwide numbers, and it opened in the UK just this weekend. Did you finally get to see Puss in Boots? I hope you did. It's incredible. The other day, I was thinking of watching it for a third time, but I didn't want to pay for it. I'll wait till it becomes available at no extra cost because I've already seen it twice. And of course, it continues to dominate on digital, where people have been buying it so they can now watch it as many times as they want. How many times have you seen Puss in Boots uh, too? Again, I've seen it twice, and I've seen Avatar three times, actually. But one was a press screening, so I didn't pay for it. All right, but Uni's other hot movie right now, Megan, has cooled a bit, uh, sliding behind BTS's concert movie and A Man Called Otto. But Megan, also made for cheap like other horror movies, and also doing very well on digital like Puss in Boots 2, is still a huge win for all involved. And of course, that sequel is already dated for 2025. I'm excited. At the bottom of the top 10, faith-based, crowd-funded series Chosen got into the top 10 yet again. We've seen it in here before with another Fathom event. Well, Pathon, I'm going to do Pathon justice. Some of you tweeted me about this. Pathon is still in the top 10 in its second weekend, but might even be higher than this. Because it turns out, after the dust settled last weekend, Pathon actually opened at number 3 last weekend with 6.8 million, right behind Avatar 2 and Puss in Boots 2. That's incredible. Hopefully, overseas distributors who are releasing domestically can get better at reporting their numbers so they make the Sunday morning deadline for those very important box office headlines. Uh, over, it was like if a movie opened in third place but nobody knew about it, did it really? It's like a tree in the woods, my friend. Uh, over on streaming, let's start with Nielsen for the first week of January. SNL had a sketch last night, by the way, with Hollywood trivia. How many of you knew the answer about Ginny and Georgia? If you did, I'm very proud of you. In fact, I think, I think except for one, I knew the answer to every single question on there. So I took a little bit of offense at that sketch, but I knew that anybody who was uh, a part of the BTT community could win that game as well. Uh, and while nobody liked Kaleidoscope, at least everyone gave it a whirl with a strong debut. And, and you know what? Any win for Giancarlo Esposito, what a sweetheart, is a good day in my, in my book. Although I'm still not going to watch that show. I bet it drops like a rock in its second week because the word of mouth on that was horrible. Only Prime Video and Peacock were able to break Netflix's hold on the overall chart. On Originals, Prime Video's Jack, uh, Jack Ryan uh, is the only non-Netflix show here, doing quite well a few weeks in, so that's impressive. Uh, that's great. You know, we, uh, you know, we've been missing John Krasinski, but he's still got it. And while Yellowstone's previous seasons on Peacock continue to do very well on the acquired list, and they're still on the overall, too, Speaking of Saturday Night Live, by the way, I loved the joke that Bo and Yang made that Yellowstone is like succession only outside. That made me laugh. I like that one. And White Lotus, though, finally fell out of the top 10 on Acquired. It had a great run, though. It had a great run. And it's, I think it's third 
uh, entity because it's not a season. It's not a season. But I think its third entry is going to be really hot out of the gate. I'm excited. Uh, with movies, these numbers are always surprisingly weak because it seems even on streaming, it's hard for movies to compete with shows that are essentially six to ten hour movies. Because, you know, Nielsen's doing by viewing minutes. HBO Max, though, has another win with their leftover Fox deal with The Menu. Did very well for them. Although this wasn't a strong enough number to even make the overall chart. But here you can see it's number three. Meanwhile, Prime Video continues to do very well with Chris Pratt, another one of their stars, this time streaming uh, Universal's Jurassic World Dominion uh, at no extra cost. Uh, on Netflix's charts for just last week, You People isn't a huge hit, but it's definitely a solid, that's a solid, debuting at number one. Nobody should be embarrassed by that. It's not that hot. But, you know, I think it did, that probably did its best. I watched that, actually. And it was actually very offensive. It was more just kind of boring. Uh, but I did watch it all the way through. Uh, Devotion has also debuted in the global top 10, even though it's only available in a handful of countries on Netflix. I saw that, too. Because, you know, it went to Digital and Paramount Plus. But it's a very good movie, even though, again, I think there's an issue with uh, properly miking Jonathan Majors. You can't hear all of his lines. Uh, but it's a very good movie based on a true story that everybody should know about. And I think it's actually perfect for digital and streaming. So I'm glad to see it doing well here. It must have done very well to, again, make the top 10 when it's only like in a handful of countries. With shows, there's Ginny and Georgia season two, still number one for four weeks now. Well, that 90s show went up a notch to number four and just got renewed for a second season. Will the OG stars who cameoed in season one get up to season regulars? If I were Netflix, I would spend the money to make that happen. They're not busy. They are not busy. They are available. Ashton Kutcher making headlines this week for the horrible, awkward body language between him and Reese Witherspoon promoting their upcoming Netflix rom-com. Maybe because he doesn't believe in showering? It was really weird. I mean, aren't they actors? That's how much they must not like each other. Wow. Speaking of, uh, but I still think that one looks pretty good. But anyway, speak, I mean, it's Valentine's Day. We need, I mean, it's, it's slow right now. Speaking of great movies, perfect for digital streaming, Plane hit digital on Friday, and it is rightfully the number one movie. Ah, I love that film. So good. You should watch that. Black Panther Wakanda Forever, which hit Disney Plus on Wednesday as well, is also doing very well, while Universal and Awards Flicks continue to dominate. Babylon started on digital on Tuesday and was very strong out of the gate. But look how competitive the digital space has become. It's as competitive as theatrical. The same week, Black Panther Wakanda Forever hit the next day and then Plane hit on Friday, knocking Babylon down to the bottom of the top 10. Uh, Anna, Con Anna Kendrick also had a movie go basically right to digital and it managed to debut in the top 10. What's going on with you, Anna? What's going on with you? As for, the, I mean, what are you, Mel Gibson or Bruce Willis? Come on. As for this coming weekend, this is a weird one. On the one hand, next weekend is the Super Bowl. So Sunday is spoken for. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Again, we're going to have so much fun. So many trailers. Uh, and I believe some people are also watching for the football. <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to get more into sports, though. As you know, I watched the championship game, had a great time. But anyway, and then Quantumania is the weekend after that. So who's going? that's a very small window before Quantumania comes in and takes over all the premium screens and just everybody's interest. Uh, but still, next weekend, also, this coming weekend also leads into Valentine's Day and Galentine's Day. So some uh, studios and streamers are going to want to take advantage of that, right? Because, uh, you know, because with Valentine's Day on a, a Tuesday, some people will celebrate over the weekend. So this is what we've got. A lot of Valentine's Day themed stuff. Here we go. Magic Mike from Warner Brothers Discovery is hitting theaters. Not a big ad campaign. Have you seen anything really besides that first trailer? But it does seem to have a pretty wide release. Uh, also, for those looking for romance, Titanic is getting re-released in high-res 3D. Although, the third act of Avatar 2 is so much like Titanic, I can't imagine watching Titanic again. And just James Cameron does have kind of a specific flavor these days. And, you know, when I said about kind of like a little bit about the hokiness and, you know, the, hot, the, the, you know, the um, overperforming in terms of craftsmanship, you know, I, I, you know what I'm saying. Don't you think those movies are kind of alike? So I think it would be weird to sit down and watch Titanic again so close to Avatar 2. But never underestimate Jimmy, right? We're not going to make that mistake again. We'll see how the movie does. But even though it's high-res 3D, it's not getting most premium screens. It has a few Dolby's. You might want to check that out if you're interested in seeing it. Avatar 2 is keeping its IMAX screens, while Magic Mike is taking over most Dolby's from Knock at the Cabin. Only one week 
for Knock at the Cabin on premium screens. That sucks. <laughs> Although I don't think it has that big of an audience, but wow. Talk about having to get everyone to go out weekend number one. Quantumania then, of course, will take over all premium screens the, co- the weekend after that. And Disney doesn't mess around. They locked down all premium screens for multiple weeks. I believe for Avatar, they said they had to have them for four or maybe even six weeks. I don't remember. I don't recall the exact number off the top of my head. But Disney's not going to risk losing those screens. They won't even give a movie to a theater unless they promise to lock down the premium screens for a, co- a preset number of weeks, no matter how the movie performs. Although Disney movies tend to perform very well. Uh, but streaming, streaming has a ton of new Valentine's Day content, right? So movies on Friday, all on Friday. Well, actually not on Tuesday. I don't know if this counts as a Valentine's Day movie, but I want to dance with somebody. The Whitney Houston movie will hit digital. Uh, as I said in my review, uh, I reviewed it during a live stream. This is a little bit like a Lifetime movie, but a pretty good Lifetime movie. And it does Uh, really take a very serious and touching look at Whitney Houston's LGBT romance uh, that she had throughout her life. So you might want to check that out. Also, I think it's very honest about Whitney Houston and the music industry. It's it's actually a pretty good streaming movie. Uh, Then on Friday, Paramount Plus has At Midnight, Prime Video has Somebody I Used to Know, and Netflix has that Ashton Kutcher, Reese Witherspoon rom-com. So maybe they do a better job in the movie than they did on the red carpet. Uh, Netflix also has Korean rom-com actioner, Love to Hate You, on Friday, as well as You, which is maybe more of a Galentine's Day show, but that's dropping season four, part one, on Thursday, which is the same day that HBO Max drops the Harley Quinn Valentine's Day special. I've seen it. I've seen it. It's about 45 minutes long, so you definitely get a good chunk of uh, content. But it's definitely for adults. It is like the most, it's the most adult thing I've ever watched. Uh, And I'll be doing a half spoiler review that day because, you know, it's hard to talk about it without having spoilers. So I'll do a half spoiler review. That means the first half will be not spoilers. Now you can go watch it and come back. Uh, As for non-Valentine's Day content this coming week, Apple TV has their own original movie, Sharper, uh, a thriller with Julianne Moore, Sebastian Stan, John Lithgow, and Justice Smith. That's a pretty good cast. That's a pretty good cast. Uh, Well, Netflix has new animated movie, My Dad the Bounty Hunter, which looks adorable. As there's also a documentary from Netflix about Bill Russell on Wednesday. So that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And what do you think of Hollywood's new reality? Are movies like Knock at the Cabin and 80 for Brady the best they can hope for? Or are they aiming a little bit too low? Share those thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.